Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Bible Church. Did everyone enjoy your drive to church today? The weather is gorgeous, and I just want to praise Jesus for that. You know, sometimes I think it's easier to, to remember to bless his name in the suffering and the trials than it is when things are good. So, um, to turn every blessing that he gives us back to praise to him. Amen. And so um, I was convicted of that this morning, so I thought I would start right now. So, um, but now to our announcements. Um, today is our Pastor Appreciation Day Lunch Fellowship, and not only do we have the pastor here, but we have the pastor's wife here. We are very <laughs> thankful that Susan is able to join us this week, and we are praying and hoping that, that she will be a permanent fixture soon. I'll take it. Uh, so please um, join us in the back, even if you didn't know before right now that that's what we're doing. If you didn't bring anything, that is fine. The Lord always provides more than enough food. We are very good at that. So um, join us and join Randy and Susan um, for lunch. 
And then that also means we're not going to have prayer meeting tonight. We will do our fellowshipping and that uh, at lunchtime, so um, we will not be meeting for prayer this evening. Um, next Saturday, the ladies are going to come here, and, we're, and they're going to be um, cleaning up um, basically back in the addition, the, the children's rooms back there, the fellowship hall, the kitchen. Um, so bring a lunch dish to share and your favorite cleaning product and join us, ladies. We will have a grand time together. Um, and then, this is just something that we wanted to um, make you guys aware of. Humble House is one of our missions partners, and they um, have just acquired their forever home. Um, and if anybody doesn't know, Humble House is an addiction recovery program for um, women. And so they're having their open house on October 17th. Um, it starts at 9, it's 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. The ribbon coating is at 10, and... Um, they would love for you to come check out their new place and see what they're doing. And uh, that, oh, also on the back of your bulletin, you'll notice some um, prayer requests for our missionaries. Um, Freddie and Raquel, the container is in country now, so please be praying that it will fly through customs with no problem and get, uh, and get to... The, where it needs to go soon, as well as they are preparing for a November team. Barry and Terry. Terry is back in country, and so just pray as they are re-engaging with their um, friends that, that there will be some Holy Spirit connection and they will be able to share um, the uh, hope of Jesus with their neighbors. And then Anna with Envision Atlanta, just um, she has a a few praises and prayer requests for their after-school program up in Clarkston. So just post this somewhere and be praying for them this month. Also, we're going to go back, maybe. Oh, i got to turn it back on. And John's going to tell us a little more about the Humble House because he is here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Daphne. Nice segue there. I surprised her. I caught her off guard. Uh, I was supposed to do this last Sunday, but I wasn't able to get here, so um, I'm glad I was able to do it this Sunday. I uh, just want to put in a plug for the Men of Valor, uh, I think I call it a retreat. Um, it's coming up very soon, November 3rd through 5th, down at Lake uh, Swan. If you, Some of you have been there before, I think, but it's down in Melrose, Florida, about a four and a half hour drive from here. What is Men of Valor? Uh, they've quoted a verse here they're going to use as a theme for this. So it's uh, men anywhere from 13 years up to 150 years or what, however old that might be. Um, it says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Uh, <clears throat> Let all that you do be done in love. So that's the theme of the Men of Valor uh, Retreat Weekend. Just to give you an idea of what it's all about, four and a half hour drive there. So we'll be leaving uh, about um, noonish on Friday um, if we are able to leave that early. If you can't leave that early, probably have another car going a little later. Uh, the idea is to get down there for dinner on uh, Friday evening. There's all kinds of fellowship and study going on uh, during Saturday, which includes a few hours of free time. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Um, they haven't given me the verses that they'll be studying and so on, but I think there's going to be a choice of two or three different like seminar type things or Bible study type things that the men might go to. The age group, again, will be anywhere from 12 years old or 13 years old up to whatever can get there. Um, so uh, probably be uh, mostly middle-aged men. Um, <clears throat> but uh, a lot of dinner, a lot of campfires, a lot of fellowship, worship together. Uh, Sunday after worship service, then uh, I get a packed lunch to go and, and head on home. So I'll probably be home about 5 p.m. or something like that on on uh, Friday. On excuse me, on Sunday. Um, but so the, it's a serious meeting. Of t uh, but I have to just plug the camp. It's a great camp. They have all kinds of activities there. There's a waterfront there. They got a slide. They have ski boats. They might be firing up to give you an idea. Basketball courts. Um, something called. I got to share this one thing. Somebody can tell me later what this is because I don't even know what it is. It's called a Gaga ball pit. And somebody knows what I got. Somebody tell me what a gaga ball pit is later, okay? So there's going to be some fun too. But uh, if you haven't already planned on coming, please do. Uh, men, uh, please plan on coming. And let me know. We, uh, we have to be registered sometime in the next week or so, but it could be done even up till the very last minute, they told me. Oh, I didn't tell you. Bunk houses. Be staying in a bunk house or a tent, depending on what you want to do. Thanks a lot. 
Okay, I don't know if you noticed, but John is looking really dapper this morning, so I'm thinking we should have him get out announcements more frequently just to see him. <laughs> All right, we'll give you the, the little bit chill in the air this morning on that right there. We want to welcome you to um, Heritage Bible Church, and I'm so grateful for everyone can, that's able to be here. I know we have some folks that are traveling today, so of course we want to keep them in our prayers as well for those who are unable to join us today. Um, as we go to prayer this morning to open the service, I want us to be cognizant about what's happening with Israel. And um, does anyone not know what's going on right now? Because uh, actually when we were talking this morning, there was one uh, couple of people that did not know, had uh, not heard about the news. Hamas has uh, basically invaded Israel on the southern border, uh, fired about 5,000 uh, rockets into it, causing all sorts of destruction. They've had all sorts of paramilitary terrorists going in there, slaughtering people, grabbing hostages, doing all this. They're basically right now in an all-out state of war against terrorists. And these are people who are slaughtering women and children. They're grabbing uh, hostages just for the sake of having hostages. I mean, the, this is terrorism. This is not war. These are not the rules of engagement with war. And we need to remember, Israel is and continues to be the apple of God's eye. And we need to be praying for them. And, you know, Scripture specifically even tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So as we come this morning in prayer, I want us to remember them, especially in this state of war now that they are happening, as well as the fact of a concern that other nations around them could get involved. Now Hamas is firing rockets out of Lebanon, which means that Lebanon likewise is at least supporting this somehow. Iran obviously providing them with a lot of the material. So um, this can escalate and this can be ugly. So let's keep them in prayer. Let's go to prayer this morning and, and celebrate God despite all this as well. Father, we turn our eyes to you. We quiet our hearts before you. Lord, nothing happens here in this world that you're unaware of, that catches you by surprise. Lord, you are God over all things, and we give you praise this morning. We do remember your people, Israel. This is your chosen nation, Lord. Whether they follow you or not, they are still your people. You still made those promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob regarding the land, regarding the covenant. And so we continue, we pray now, Lord, that you would continue to watch over them, that you would give them safety, that you would give them victory. Um, and Lord, we see what terrorism does. We see how evil that is, that there are no rules of engagement with evil. And so we pray now for your safety over the people of Israel, over all the tourists that are still there, Lord. Some of them have been slaughtered as well, people from other nations. And so, Lord, care for them, guard them, bring them victory. This morning, Lord, we want to worship you. We want to bring our hearts and all that we are to you, Lord. And we say you are welcome in this place, Lord. May we encounter you. May we leave changed because we've been in your presence this morning. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As, uh, as you notice, I have a, uh, a spousal unit here with me this morning, as my, as my brother refers to his wife. Uh, and I'm so excited to have Susan here. But I will tell you, having her around is a little bit more distracting than when I'm just here by myself. So I just realized that about five minutes before service started that I did not get anybody to read the scripture, the opening scripture. So you know who's going to read it this morning? Me. Unless, unless somebody wants to volunteer. I see no hands. Okay, I'm reading. <laughs> okay, let's all stand for the reading of scripture. And you know, this is especially notable given what's going on in Israel right now too. Praise awaits you, our God, in Zion. 
To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Amen. Oh, uh-huh. 
Well, good morning a second time. <laughs> I just figured I would wait that out for a minute. Good morning a second time. Hey, there you go. Okay. You're not supposed to be sleeping until I start preaching, okay? You guys are getting a head start on me here, so. <laughs> um, as we usually do here, I just want to take a moment to... Uh, thank people, first of all, for being faithful with your tithes, your offerings, all that. Uh, for If we have any visitors here this morning, uh, we have a plate that's over on the table right where you come in. Um, anything that you would want to leave there, including with the bulletins, there's a little tear-off part. If you have prayer needs, if you want uh, to connect with me or one of the elders or any other thing else, uh, anything else like that, you can fill that out and put that in the plate as well, and we will get back to you uh, likewise on that. But we want to, at this point, just take time to thank God for the tithes and offerings and gifts that have come into the house of the, God, of the Lord this week. We always try not to make a big deal about it, but we don't want to not make we do not want to make a no deal about it because giving is a part of our worship as well. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are the giver of all things. You are the giver of good gifts. And so when we bring our tithes and our offerings and our gifts into your house for your work, Lord, we're just giving back to you a portion that you have given to us. Lord, we do it in gratitude. We don't do it out of compulsion. We don't do it out of manipulation. And we don't do it to buy your favor. Lord, we, we come to you with our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. Basically, Lord, hearts that just want to love you, that want to give back. And so we ask, Lord, Bless those gifts that have come in. And Lord, use them for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, um, thanks, with, uh, thanks to Stephanie, who is insistent upon dragging me into the 21st century. I have a little controller, and I'm actually going to try to remember to advance those slides once in a while here as I'm, uh, as I'm preaching this morning. So... The, um, the title of my sermon this morning, and I want to explain this even as we get going, Spirit-Empowered Kingdom Advancement. Now, I will admit, that sounds like a really dry title or maybe something that's going to be heavy theologically, and you are going to want to go to sleep during this thing. Um, it's not really intended for that at all. I, I, I actually struggled with the title this week because I was going, what captures what this section of Scripture is about? And, and all along here, as we've been looking at Acts, it is about the Spirit building His church. The Spirit is inspiring. The Spirit is empowering. The Spirit is leading. The Spirit is undergirding. All of these things. And then when He's doing those things, what's the purpose. And so in this case here, the power of the Holy Spirit has to do with advancing the kingdom of God. That's the whole point. We want to see, because right now, I mean, Satan still, you, all you have to do is walk outside our door. All you have to do is turn on any media source and you see what's going on. You still see Satan having a heyday. But in the midst of this, even as Jesus noted, the kingdom of God is advancing, and it will continue to advance, and that is the purpose of the Holy Spirit's empowering, is to advance the kingdom of God, take back what the enemy has taken away. And so we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 4, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 5, I forgot to change that on this, uh, 5, 12 through 16. So, first of all, if you have your bulletins and you uh, pull them out, please. I always write at the top a little bit of thought that prepares, prepares the way for the message here. A uh, little John the Baptist statement. So, what do we envision when we think about God? 
A.W. Tozer once noted, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. You know, we may think of God as holy, righteous, and loving. We may dwell almost exclusively on him as our savior. How often do we think of him as our general, leading to victory in spiritual war? Although it's unseen, the spiritual world is more real than our physical world. That's why Paul wrote, we wrestle against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's Ephesians 6.12. Thus, to advance God's kingdom, we need spiritual power. Without it, we end up fighting an earthly battle. And that's the wrong battle. So going to the scripture. Yes. Yay. All right, applause. <laughs> I need a little cue card here for when I do this. Uh, okay. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people, highly, uh, the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into, these, into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So as I usually try to do, I want to summarize what that short section of scripture is in one line. And I would say it, that it has to do with reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit which grows the church and destroys the work of the devil. Let me repeat that. Reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit grows the church and destroys the works of the devil. Dr. Paul Brand, many of you may have heard of him. Uh, he had, he's written many books, including the, the title, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. And he was speaking to a medical college in India about Matthew 5.16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now in front of the lectern was an oil lamp with its cotton wick burning from the shallow dish of oil. And as he preached, the lamp ran out of oil, the wick burned dry, and the smoke made him cough. He immediately used the opportunity. Some of us here are like this wick, he said. We're trying to shine for the glory of God, but we smolder, smoke, and burn out. That's what happens when we use ourselves as the fuel for our witness rather than the Holy Spirit. Wicks can last indefinitely, burning brightly and without irritating smoke, if the fuel, the Holy Spirit, is in constant supply. So a little background here. As I've reviewed each week, as we're working through the book of Acts, that the book of Acts, as I've mentioned, it's that bridge between the life of Jesus and everything that came after that, all the letters of Paul and the others, the Apocalypse. It's a historical book that gives us a context for the letters. It also gives us the early, the, the, the history of the early church. We wouldn't know much without the book of Acts. And throughout the book of Acts, we see the presence of the Holy Spirit building the church and expanding the kingdom of God through spirit-empowered believers. And as I pointed out last week, a new point that I had missed before, every chapter in the book of Acts except chapter 27 says something about evangelism. This 
first church history textbook is essentially a history of evangelism. And last week, as I was preaching, we were looking at Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 511, and we saw there were three different things that were going on. First of all, we saw how believers were moved. Some believers who owned lands and houses were moved by the Holy Spirit to sell them as there was need in the community because there were poor people and they had needs for food and shelter and other kinds of things. So periodically, people would sell something and bring the money to the feet of the apostles to be used for those needs. And then the next part there had to do with actually giving the example of Barnabas. It was, this was an example of how to do it the right way. And so Barnabas sold a field and he brought that money And it was just out of the generosity of his heart. And it was actually reflective, especially of Barnabas, of of his very heart. He was known, Barnabas literally means son of encouragement. His real name was Joseph. But from that point on, we saw that throughout the rest of the New Testament, he's just known as the son of encouragement. That that, his character so overrode everything else that that became his name. And then ultimately, the big part of what we looked at last week had to do with Ananias and Sapphira and how not to give to the Lord, how not, basically how not to be a hypocrite and how God views that so harshly. It wasn't that they, in selling a piece of property, that that they did anything wrong. And it wasn't in bringing money to the Lord that they did anything wrong. It was that they decided they were not only going to keep a part of the, prop, of, of the profits for their own, that, that was okay, but they decided to portray themselves as being more generous than they were, claiming, oh, this is the whole price that we got, secretly keeping money aside. And so in presenting themselves hypocritically that way to the people, uh, to the apostles, really what they were doing was lying to the Holy Spirit, and they were stealing from God at that point. And we saw how that was reflective of the situation with Achan in the Old Testament, just as they were getting ready. They had just started the conquest of the Promised Land. Jericho had fallen, and Achan took some things that were supposed to be just devoted to God. He essentially stole them from God right at the beginning of that campaign, in in the promised land. God held him accountable. He and his family were stoned because of that sin, because the Israelites had to learn right at the beginning, you cannot disobey God. You cannot cross God, and God sees everything. If you want success, if you want the blessing of the Lord, you have got to be obedient, and God cares so much about that he will, about that, that he will even exact what seem to us harsh penalties in order to accomplish that. Because the whole purpose of the discipline, even the harsh, discipline, uh, the, the harsh penalty, is so that he can bless us and that he can work through us. We've got to be a holy community. community. And so that was what happened here with Ananias and Sapphira, when God actually struck them dead. At the start, really, of the church growing, he had to deal with sin. He had to deal with it definitively, or else that bad leaven could work through the loaf. It could destroy the early church. It could destroy any opportunity of God blessing the work that he wanted to grow. And so that was what we looked at last week, and that brings us to where we are today. Now, it's very easy to skim over this section we're doing today, Acts 5, 12 through 16. And the reason I say that is these verses look just like a transitional paragraph between that tragic story about Ananias and Sapphira. And then the very next narrative, which is sort of this attention-grabbing narrative about the arrest of the 12 apostles by the Sanhedrin. In the midst of those two stories are these four verses. And there are significant lessons to be learned here, so we don't want to skim over them. And we're going to find out that they're more than just filler between two important biblical studies, stories. So beginning 
with the first section, Signs, Wonders, and Unity, verse 512. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So as I just reviewed there, there were two attacks that had come, across, uh, come against the church in those opening chapters of Acts. The first one was from the outside. It was the Sanhedrin arresting Peter and John after them healing, after God healing a, a lame man through them uh, at the temple. And then we saw the, that was an attack from the outside. And then we saw the attack from the inside where Satan infiltrating uh, or attempting to infiltrate through Ananias and Sapphira. Now with both of those, the church basically came through those attacks stronger. And we see believers continuing their reliance upon the Holy Spirit to build a church and advance God's kingdom. And we see God blessing that reliance in these verses. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. Note the first part of that line, through the hands of the apostles. Now, as I was looking at this, I looked at a number of different English versions and translations. Many of them will actually say the apostles performed many signs and wonders. I think that's unfortunate because a literal translation of the Greek is that first part, what we see here on the screens, through the hands of the apostles. And this may seem like a small point, but I think it's an important one. Healings, signs, wonders, other miraculous manifestations are performed by God through people. People don't do them with their own power. Individuals don't have a corner on the market for God's power either to perform spiritual acts. And so if we don't insist on this distinction between who's doing the act, who's doing the wonder, who's doing the healing, we're going to run the risk of exalting people rather than God. And you know, if we choose that latter perspective where we, I'm not sorry, if we choose the perspective where we're exalting people, that they're the ones that we somehow think in their mind, well, yeah, they're empowered by God, but they're the ones really doing the signs and wonders, then we're going to start to run after the wrong people and the wrong thing. We're going to start to chase after faith healers, miracle workers, all these other kinds of things to get our needs met, and we'll exalt them rather than running after God. And, you know, we see this happen sometimes too often in the body of Christ, which has at times just become a cult of personality. You know, people got to make sure that they tune in to their favorite televangelist or make sure that they get to whatever uh, rally or uh, occasion that's being held, that they're coming to the city and, oh, we got to go there. You know, God's going to be with us whether we go there or not. God stands every bit as much the opportunity to heal us or touch us right here or right outside or right in our homes rather than having to chase after people. And we just want to make sure that we're not doing that. So many signs and wonders were done among the people. You know, we're not told exactly what those signs and wonders are. Um, You know, a few sentences down, we do hear about healings and demonic deliverances that are occurring. But who else, who knows what else might be happening here? You know, maybe people are actually being raised by the dead. Jesus had done that in his ministry. The apostles, we're going to see later that they do it. Maybe they did that when they were sent out by Jesus the first time or second time. Maybe there are miraculous feedings because, you know, you've got a lot of hungry people. Yeah, they're selling stuff, but maybe God's multiplying food like he did with Jesus before, multiplying loaves and fishes. You know, we're not told what signs and wonders, but it's remarkable. It's remarkable enough that Luke had to write that. And so whatever the Holy Spirit is doing through the apostles, wow, I would have loved to have been there, would have loved to have seen it. And also note that many signs and wonders are being done. Apparently, there are a lot of them, and it's over a significant 
period of time, over days, over weeks, maybe even longer than that. And also that these signs and wonders are being done visibly in front of many witnesses, as it's described among the people. And so we need to ask the question here, what's the purpose of these signs and wonders? Well, key here is that word, signs. When we look at the Gospel of John, he cites seven miracles that Jesus does. And he notes at the end of his book that you, know, you, could, you probably could fill all the books in all the world with just the, the, what Jesus had done and taught and all this. Um, but he only chose seven. And out of those seven miracles, he referred to them as signs. And he used this word because he viewed Jesus' miraculous acts as something that validated his identity and his authority as the Messiah and as the Son of God. So similar, similarly, even though this is Luke writing rather than John, Luke here in Acts is highlighting the fact that the miracles, the healings, the deliverances, all of that, everything being accomplished by the apostles through the Holy Spirit are signs that their message about Jesus is authentic and truthful. And you know, moreover, because Jesus did works like these, the religious authorities are being confronted with irrefutable evidence that Jesus has empowered his disciples to do the same works. They nailed him to a cross, they stuck him in a tomb, they thought they were done with him. And they found out that was not only just the beginning, but now we have a whole bunch of disciples doing exactly what Jesus did. You thought, got rid of one, you know something, you got a whole bunch more than one out there now doing that. Additionally, these signs are signs of the presence of the kingdom of God breaking into our earthbound existence. And we really need that. We really need that kingdom of God here on the earth. And then additionally, something, and we sometimes miss this, these signs are expressions of God's compassion. He longs to alleviate the suffering and the burden of those who are sick and in pain and demonized and oppressed. So these miracles, these wonders, these signs, these healings, all of this, these show us who our God is. And isn't he an amazing God? But now to finish up with verse 12, they were, with all, they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Now I want to look at the second part of that sentence there, uh, the last part there, Solomon's porch, because that's an important thing here. I noted a few weeks ago when we looked at the healing of the lame man in Acts 3, that Solomon's porch, also be tra uh, translated as Solomon's colonnade, uh, was that all along the whole eastern side of the temple enclosure, there was a porch or roof that extended from the top of the wall back into the temple area. And this roof, it was, it was big. It was held up by two rows of columns, 37 feet high. The whole porch was about 60 feet wide. And it was called Solomon's Porch because the temple, when it was being rebuilt, had used fragments of, uh, of Solomon's temple for the construction of this porch. It could house a lot of people, 60 feet wide. That's a fairly good size. And so when we read about the multitudes gathering to listen to the disciples at Solomon's porch or Solomon's colonnade, there's plenty of room for them to be, to be found there. So also for them to gather and be taught. Additionally, this location, because it's part of the temple, puts them right under the noses of the religious authorities who have told them, do not teach, do not preach in the name of Jesus. Well, what are they doing? They're teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus, and they're doing it right underfoot to, uh, in front of the religious authorities. So they're highly visible. And you know something? You can kind of guess where this is going to be going, as we're going to see next week. 
They cannot do that without raising the ire of the religious authorities. But also, once again, Luke uses that key phrase, even with this great multitude gathered together at Solomon's porch, all with one accord. And Luke continues to drive home the point about the unity of believers, as he's, been, as he's done several times already, and we're going to see a few more times in Acts, he continues to make that point. But, you know, there's also something here with this. The unity of the believers, that's not something they just generated on their own. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit as well. One more sign, if you will, of the Holy Spirit being among them. So when you see God's people of one heart, one mind, one passion, you know what that's evidence of? That's evidence of God's Holy Spirit among those people. And it's a demonstration that Jesus is fulfilling his words to his disciples that by this, in other words, by, by loving one another, by, by this all will be known if, that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, if you're of one accord. So now authentic growth, verses 13 and 14. And I call this section authentic growth because as I've mentioned before, the church, especially kind of from the early 19th century or even late 18th century, um, somehow made a switch of moving from focusing on discipling people. And, and when they're called, they're called to be disciples of Jesus. And it, has, it changed to people making decisions for Jesus. And so in this case here, what you really want for authentic growth is you want disciples, not decision makers. They can, not converts, not people that can just walk away. You want people that are going to walk with Jesus and walk ever deeper with him. Now, as we look at these next two verses, we're going to see they can almost look a little uh, uh, confusing, even contradictory, because they kind of almost seem to say the opposite at the start. But here, verse 13, yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. Now, as I was reading and studying for this one, I found that an awful lot of people have no clue what none of the rest really means here. But it seems like the best explanation is that it's referring to those who are half-hearted or those who are kind of watching and really not sure if they're convinced by the apostles' teachings, even with the evidence of the signs and the wonders. Um, F.F. Bruce was uh, an, a noted New Testament scholar, and he had written a commentary on Acts, and he noted this. Of those who did not believe, however, none ventured to attach himself to the community. The fate of Ananias and Sapphira showed how perilous pretended or half hearted adhesion might be. That seems to indicate at least some of these, the none of the rest daring to join. Those are the ones who are not really sure, and they learned from the situation with Ananias and Sapphira, you don't mess with this God. You don't jump into this half-hearted or under wrong motives. And that explanation also makes sense in light of the second half of the sentence, but the people esteemed them highly. You know, these people who are esteeming the Christian believers are clearly not Christians. You know, they're folks in Jerusalem and around the temple. They're watching, they're listening to this growing new movement of people. They're seeing how the believers are behaving and loving one another. They're seeing the power of God demonstrated through signs and wonders. They have an awful lot of respect for those involved here. They're esteeming them highly, but they're just, for whatever reason, not yet ready to embrace the message. Maybe they're not ready to forsake all for the Messiah, but they're esteeming it and God's granting favor upon it. But now as we look at verse 14, we'll see why it seems contradictory. You have first people who are not going to join, or it's very clear, uh, no one else daring to join. And then suddenly verse 14 says, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men 
and women. So this latter group, the ones who are joining, those are the ones who are watching and listening and are both convicted and convinced. So they're believing the truth about a crucified and resurrected Savior. And they're willing to forsake all. And so they join the growing number of believers. And in combination with this, the effect of the Holy Spirit's evidence in the signs and the wonders accompanying the message bring multitudes to believing faith. Now looking at the kingdom advancing. And we want to look here more with these next verses at how the power of the Holy Spirit is affecting this evangelistic situation. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. You know, ever since Adam and Eve fell, ever since they chose to rebel against God and sin entered into the human race, sickness has been a blight on the human race. And those who suffer are desperate for relief and healing. And you know, throughout history, even to this day, with all of our technological advances, there have been limited options for those who are sick and suffering. Many people have what are termed invisible illnesses and diseases. In other words, pain, other kind of things. They're not in a wheelchair. Um, they're not disfigured. They don't have an arm in a cast or anything like that. But they can still be suffering, and most of us are unaware of how prevalent physical suffering is. I can tell you as a doctor for 20 plus years before coming here, I saw just how affected people are, how their lives are impacted. And it matters to God. And it's part of Christ's redemption for us. It's not just from sin, but it's from sickness. It's from suffering, all those things. And only God and only his power and his mercy can meet such a need and only the price that was paid on the cross of Calvary by Jesus is sufficient for such a debt to sin so that sickness can be overcome by the blood of Jesus. So in their desperate need here, this helps us understand a little bit more, their desperate need for healing, people are being brought out into the streets and they're being laid on beds and couches where Peter walks by, just on the hope, maybe, that the shadow of Peter, as he's walking by, might fall on them. And that seems like a really weird thing to us, and that seems like a really superstitious kind of thing. But as I did a little more study, I found out this, that ancient people thought that one's shadow was attached to oneself. And apparently in Jewish law at that time, if your own shadow touched a corpse, then you were as unclean as if you had touched that corpse with your physical body. So they viewed shadows, our very shadows, that thing right there, differently than we do. And so it makes a little bit more sense that they're thinking, well, even his shadow, if that touches me, maybe I'm going to get a little bit of that power for my healing. And you know, this isn't dissimilar that when Jesus was alive and ministering those three years, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, and what is she saying to herself? You know, she's, she's pushing through the crowd. If I can only touch the hem of his garment, then I'll be healed. And that's not that different as these people thinking, if only his shadow falls on me, I can be healed. And you know, either way, whether it's a shadow or a hem, people apparently were getting healed by the exercise of their faith that was being demonstrated 
by that action. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities in Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, with the apostles, we're seeing a repeat of what happened with Jesus when he was ministering for three years. Here, it notes, you know, for him, it was as word spread about Jesus, multitudes of the sick and the infirm and the demon-possessed were brought to him from neighboring towns and even from neighboring countries. You know, you had the Decapolis, which was 10 Greek cities that, uh, you know, they they weren't Jews there, uh, or they were not primarily Jewish uh, nations or, or countries or anything like that, or cities. And they heard about Jesus. They heard there was the power of God with him. And they traveled even that far. And that's what's happening now with the disciples. And the acts of God that is happening through those disciples, that people are hearing the news and they're being drawn there as well. And you know, what this tells us about God, even healing through them and, and, and the word getting out so that people were drawn to Jerusalem. They weren't just getting, dra- yeah, they were getting drawn for the healing. They were hearing the message of salvation. And you know what else happened then? Is for those who heard the message of salvation, they're going out, they're traveling to these surrounding cities. Even before the disciples are getting a chance to go out there. The message of God, the message of the risen Savior is starting to get out there. It's evangelistic in nature. And how wonderful and how good our God is that he'll use situations like this to spread the good news about Jesus. And I want you to notice also one thing we looked at last week. In Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 34, we noted that there was a verse about believers sharing everything in common, And then right after that sentence, there was a sentence about the apostles giving witness to the resurrection of Jesus, in other words, evangelistic. And then that was followed by another sentence, just like the first one, citing that certain believers sold lands and houses to share the proceeds with other believers. And the point there was that sandwiched in between these two verses about the sharing of possessions was a verse about evangelism. And the reason for that was that community life is never an end to itself. It was noted by the commentator there that I'd read that above all, this was a witness in community, and for this reason, they enjoyed much grace from the Lord. So you had something happening. It noted the evangelistic thing, and then it kind of reinforced that. And we saw that same pattern right here. Verse 12 is about signs, wonders, and healings. Verses 13 and 14 are about evangelism and people being added to the kingdom of God. And then back again, verses 15 and 16, healings and deliverances are being addressed. The power of God again. So the point is the same. And I'm adapting it slightly here. Miraculous signs and wonders, healings and deliverances are never an end of them to themselves. The church is a witnessing community. That's the purpose of the miraculous move of the Holy Spirit, to use all possible means to save souls and bring people into the kingdom. And so those miraculous things support the message of Jesus, support the preaching about Jesus, and show people that this God that they are hearing about is beyond just the world. He's beyond just time. And that he is reaching in with spirit power into our physical world, into our broken world. And he's bringing healing. He's repairing the broken and restoring them. And so an application right here is that we need to remember that we just need to keep evangelism uppermost in our hearts and minds as the mission of the church. 
as the mission of the church corporately, as the mission of this church, and even as our individual mission as members of the church. And as we do that, you know, we can seek God's Holy Spirit power for healing, for all the gifts of the Spirit, words of knowledge, ways that people can be touched by the Holy Spirit that authenticate the message about Jesus. And so along with that, I would ask the question, do we hunger for a move of God? Where he moves on people's hearts and brings conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Where he moves with gifts of his Holy Spirit. Are we afraid somehow of that gift, of those gifts of the Holy Spirit? Because we've never seen them. We've never actually had God use us to pray over somebody and actually see them be healed or anything like that. I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us individually and as a church. Let's start being bold in our prayers before God. Let's say, God, I don't know what you want to do in this situation, but I see the need. The need is beyond my power. Only your power can touch this. And so I'm going to ask you to heal this person. I'm going to ask you to miraculously deal with their financial situation. I'm going to ask you miraculously to deal with whatever relational issues they have going on that goes way, way beyond what any person, what any human can do. Lord, we need your spirit power. I want us to dare to step out to ask, to pray those bold prayers. And maybe even to say, God, will you surprise me? Will you show me even, you know, will you take whatever tenuousness of my faith is that I'm not even sure how much I believe this because I've never experienced some of these things or I haven't seen them happen often? You know, this much I can guarantee you, 100% of the prayers that we don't pray will not be answered. So let's start praying those prayers. Let's start asking those things of God and see what he does. And maybe just come with hearts of expectation that our miracle working God who raised Jesus from the dead wants to work miracles and wants to resurrect situations and relationships and healings in people. A church that Susan and I had been in previously, which will be unmentioned, there was an elderly lady, had been in that church for 30 years. Blessed, wonderful lady. But I would also say that she was comfortable. And she had even made a comment to Susan and I once, because it was a small church. She's like, you know, I'm old. I'm probably going to die next few years, something like that. I don't really want the church to change because I just love everybody here and I love the relationships that I have with people and so I'm actually afraid that if we get more people here it's going to change the church it's going to change that thing that feels like family to me and so I know this sounds selfish but I really don't want the church to grow while I'm still alive I hope you feel as much grief over that perspective as Susan and I felt. And I pray to God that we never as a church get there. Okay, Lord, I've had enough. We've had enough growth. We've had enough of a measure of your Holy Spirit being poured out. That's enough. May we never say to God, that's enough. May we always say to God, more of you, Lord, more of you because your mission is to reach the world, touch the world, save the world, heal the world. Let that be our heart's cry before the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this book of Acts that shows us how your Holy Spirit grew, the the early church empowered 
the early church, literally against all odds, this small, fledgling group of people with your Holy Spirit empowering them changed the world and took your message out to the heathen nations, to the lost people, to the broken people, and even to those that would persecute them, and they still loved them, and they still prayed for them, and they still witnessed to you. May we be like that, Lord. I pray, as, as we saw in previous prayers with this community in Acts, Lord, empower us. Send forth your Holy Spirit through us. And make us bold in our witness for you and and work miracles and signs to authenticate the message of evangelism, the message of Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation, as the only way back to you, Lord. We want to see these things. We want to experience them. And Lord, we want to see broken lives changed. We want to see people changed healed those who are suffering. That's your heart, Lord. We want to have that heart too. And so we bring that to you, Lord, and we ask, give us more of your Holy Spirit. Give us more of an awareness of who you are, more of a a vision for who you are. Give us more boldness to speak. And Lord, may, may we be a blessing to you for the expansion of your kingdom here in Panama City and even throughout the world. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Now as the worship team's coming back up, I'm sorry, actually, singular, worship, singular, plus the rest of the folks there. Um, If people want healing, if they want me and the elders or others to pray with you, please come up after service and we'll gather around you and we're going to believe that God wants to pour out his Holy Spirit to touch and to heal. So I just want to make, I don't want to just be talking about it, we want to see it. So, thank you. Please stand for the closing hymn. Please remain standing for the benediction. Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord 
with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.